Welcome to Aaron Menke's Cabinet of Curiosities, a production of iHeartRadio and Grim and Mild. Our world is full of the unexplainable. And if history is an open book, all of these amazing tales are right there on display, just waiting for us to explore. Welcome to the Cabinet of Curiosities. He was a curious child. When the Great Depression hit in the 1920s, his family didn't have a lot of money for the basics, much less extras like toys. So young Richard Thompson James had to get creative. Then in 1927, he stumbled upon an abandoned 1923 Buick. At just 13, he was determined to fix up the car. And after getting it to run, he sold it for $25. The effort sparked a love affair with how things worked. By the late 1930s, equipped with a mechanical engineering degree, Richard found a job as a naval engineer. When World War II began, he was tasked with designing a system to support and stabilize instruments for sailing through rough seas. On a muggy day in 1943, he knocked over a spare parts bin. As the parts hit the floor, an idea struck him, rekindling his curiosity as a child of the Depression. He spent a year improving upon the concept. He told his wife, Betty, that he was certain he could sell it as a toy, and asked her to come up with a name for it. While she searched dictionaries for just the right word, Richard formed an LLC after securing a loan from a friend. In 1946, he made 400 units and marketed them to toy shops. Store after store rejected the toy. It was too plain, too simple. None of that deterred Richard, though. Instead, he set his sights even higher. He convinced Gimbel's department store in Philadelphia to include the toy in their Christmas display window. As the weeks went on, it appeared his simple toy didn't stand a chance against the newest dolls and shiny trains. Even this didn't stop Richard, though. He told his wife to meet him at the department store in a couple of hours. He gathered up a few of the toys and headed downtown. He set up a display right outside the store. He gave the store customers an interactive demonstration. By the time his wife arrived, Richard sold all 400 units for a dollar apiece. Lines wrapped around the building with customers signing up to buy more. Just before Christmas, they sold 20,000, and it didn't stop there. The couple set up a booth at the American Toy Fair in New York the following year. By the end of 1947, the toy was a national phenomenon. Two years after that, they'd sold a million units for a dollar apiece, earning one million in revenue. That amounts to about $1 billion today. But popularity began to decline by the 1960s. One day, Richard confessed to Betty that he'd been having multiple affairs. Moreover, he announced that he was leaving her and their six children to join a cult in Bolivia. He told her that he no longer had use for money and gave her two choices, liquidate or become the sole owner. Betty took the latter option. She quickly discovered another surprise, though. Her husband had given away their money to the cult, leaving her seven figures in debt. For the welfare of her children, it was Betty who now had to get creative. She hired a marketing firm to create a jingle. It worked, becoming one of the most recognizable jingles of the 1960s and 70s. But rebuilding the company was hard work. She put in a lot of hours and was forced to leave her kids with a caregiver four days a week. In the early 1970s, the company made a more colorful version of the toy, and popularity soared. Betty went on to make the toy more successful than her husband ever had, selling millions of variations and more than 300 million copies of the original. In 1998, she sold the company for what she described as a boatload of money. She'd taken a rundown company and turned it around. For 50 years, she made the toy a bestseller despite every new fad and gadget to come along. Betty produced enough of the toys to circle the earth 121 times and negotiated a deal with Pixar to use the toy as a character in Toy Story, effectively doubling her sales. That simple object Betty named in 1946 and creatively built to be one of history's most fun and wonderful toys, you might have heard that it walks downstairs, alone or in pairs. Everyone knows it's Slinky.
There are few things as traumatic as a house fire. When I was growing up, a house directly down the street from my own, a house lived in by a classmate of mine from school, tragically caught fire one December night, burning the entire structure to the ground. Thankfully, everyone made it out alive, but the devastation was complete. Family heirlooms, wrapped Christmas presents, clothing, toys, photo albums. Name a precious object and they lost it. And maybe that's why so many of us fear going through the same experience. Pull a world history book off the shelf and you'll find a number of citywide fires listed too. The Great Fire of London took place in 1666, destroying over 13,000 houses and making some 75% of the people living there homeless. In 1871, it was the Great Chicago Fire, taking the lives of nearly 250 people. Rome has burned, as has Amsterdam, Munich, Edinburgh, and Moscow, just to name a few. And most of the cities on the list burned so easily because firefighting was usually sloppy, slow, or just plain non-existent. But then came Frederick Graff. He was a hydraulic engineer born in Philadelphia in 1775, who worked for a long time as a carpenter and a draftsman. But it was in 1795 that he took a job as an assistant to a man named Benjamin Latrobe, who was an architect behind the Center Square Waterworks. On the site of today's Philadelphia City Hall once stood one of his creations, the Pump House, It pulled water from the nearby river using steam-powered pumps, stored it in massive wooden tanks, and then let gravity feed it out to nearby houses and businesses using wooden pipes. And Frederick Graff was right there beside him, learning and thinking. In 1805, he was elected to the position of superintendent of the waterworks there, but he and others began to notice that the system was just not powerful enough. They needed something bigger and better and by 1811, he was guiding the construction of a new facility. Frederick was also a fan of forward thinking. All over the city, the water mains beneath the cobblestones were made of wood, and I'm sure they worked for a long while, but wood can rot or crack or warp out of alignment. So as Frederick made improvements to the old system, he began to replace those old wooden mains with new iron ones. But that created a new problem. You see, for a while, if a fire broke out somewhere in the city, one method of fighting it was to pull up the cobblestones, tap into the water main, and then use the water to fight the blaze. When they were done, they plugged the holes in the main, called fire plugs for obvious reasons, and then reburied them. It was smart and inventive, but the new iron pipes couldn't be tapped so easily. So Frederick went to the drawing board and came up with the plan. At various intervals along the new iron water mains, he would install permanent exposed fire plugs, basically sealed faucets that could, if the need arose, be used by firefighters. I probably don't have to say this out loud, but just in case you haven't pictured it in your mind, I will. Frederick Graff had invented the fire hydrant. Today, it's a common fixture in every neighborhood, both figuratively and literally. But when he first proposed the idea, it was revolutionary. As metal water mains began to spread to more and more cities, so too did this other fresh idea. Today, firefighters everywhere, along with dogs with full bladders, have Frederick Graff to thank for the tool that makes their job more efficient and much more manageable. In an odd twist of fate, though, it's impossible to say for certain if Frederick Graff was indeed the inventor of the fire hydrant. We know about his work from other sources, but the actual patent for the device the document that would make a rock-solid case for his inventiveness, no longer exists. Why? Because it was kept in the U.S. Patent Office in Washington, D.C., which was destroyed in 1836. The cause? A fire. I hope you've enjoyed today's guided tour of the Cabinet of Curiosities. Subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts or learn more about the show by visiting curiositiespodcast.com. This show was created by me, Aaron Mankey, in partnership with How Stuff Works. I make another award-winning show called Lore, which is a podcast, book series, and television show. And you can learn all about it over at theworldoflore.com. And until next time, stay curious. Thank you.